in here. Uh, good morning or good afternoon, uh, depending on where you are tuning in from across the country at many of our uh, good institutions that we know are, are represented and listening in and doing really good, but really hard work right now. And so uh, we are excited for you to join us in this conversation. Um, and as we were just kind of chatting a little bit before we got going, we we're in this conversation with you. We are all uh, learning from one another, it seems, day by day uh, as we face really a, an unprecedented, I keep using the word unprecedented, but now it seems mm -hmm. uh, like an understatement over the past uh, few weeks. And so we're in this together and glad that you can join listening in on this conversation. Uh, my name is Brian Jensen. I am a consultant with Vanderblumen, uh, an organization that helps Christian organizations all over the globe, really. Uh, as we uh, work to navigate uh, primarily staffing issues, but what, whatever we can come alongside. And right now we've been coming along organizations doing a lot of different things right now. And uh, we're here as we listen and pray together. Um, I, myself, I spent 15 years on CCCU campuses, uh, the first being North Central University up in Minneapolis. And then I spent 12 years at Geneva College, just north of Pittsburgh. And uh, most of my time, cut my teeth in student affairs, and spent most of my time in student affairs. Uh, the last bit uh, being at Geneva as the vice president of student development and enjoyed my time there thoroughly. Uh, have navigated uh, a number of crises over my time on, on CCTU campuses, albeit on a very micro level compared to what we're all experiencing now. And so I want you to know that I, I've been in your shoes and I, I uh, I feel for you, and again, I know it's it's hard work, but it's really good work, and we want to encourage you today. So I'm going to let William Vanderblumen uh, say a few words as we get going, and then I'm going to have our esteemed panelists introduce themselves. Thanks, Brian. Uh, you've added so much to our education practices. We've tried to help schools find their key staff. Uh, I started this. I'll be trying to be quiet. I'm a recovering uh, preacher, so I ramble. And uh, I, we started by helping churches find their pastoral staff and then branched out into nonprofits and schools. And, and when this pandemic hit, I thought a couple of things. One, is there anything unique I have to say? And two, uh, I'm not real smart, but if I, if I plan the party and invite smart people, then I get to attend. So that's my hope today is that we've invited some really smart people that know Christian uh, education at the college and university level to really talk about a number of things somewhat centered around uh, what's going to happen with the fall <clears throat> semester. And I think my unique voice in this is that I have downstairs someone very interested in that. I think I'm the only CCCU parent on this call right now, but I've got a sophomore at Baylor that is really wondering, Dad, what's going to happen? And uh, so I'm excited to learn. And, and Brian, why don't you take it away with the introductions of people and, and go from there? Wonderful. Just a couple housekeeping things. Um, we know people are uh, joining us from all over. Thank you for being here. If you do have questions, please, please submit them. We have a number of things we want to we want to throw to our panelists to get their thoughts. Again, we're all learning through this and we're going to talk together. But if you have specific questions, we would love for you to throw them our way. We will, we will try and get to as many of those towards the end. And if, if we don't get to all of them, we'll try and do follow up. Um, so please go ahead and submit those to us. I'm going to allow each of our panelists to introduce themselves, and I've asked them to tell us just a little bit about their current work, what they're doing, and then, and then offer a word of encouragement. What I have found as I've talked to so many people the last few weeks is um, how we're encouraging one another as we're going through this together just is so meaningful to people. And so I've asked them just to share a specific word of encouragement that they've been offering to institutional leaders over the past few weeks. So, David, I'm going to let you start uh, by introducing yourself. Well, thank you, Brian, and I thank uh, you and William for hosting uh, this event today and Holly Tate for coordinating uh, this time. It's a privilege to be here with uh, good friends, with Barry, Shirley, and uh, Robert. Uh, I I've known them all for a long time and have great respect for the three of them, and it's a, a genuine joy to participate with uh, them in this uh, conversation. Uh, I met Robert Sloan back in 1980, so 40 years we've been traveling this uh, friendship road uh, together. Uh, but I currently uh, serve with the International Alliance for Christian Education, 
and also wear a couple of hats at Southwestern Baptist uh, Seminary and uh, have wonderful privilege of serving my alma mater in that uh, way. Um, my 36th year to be involved in Christian higher education, uh, two thirds of those as the president at uh, a long term stint at Union University and a shorter term at Trinity uh, in Chicago. And uh, I, it's uh, a privilege to participate in this conversation with colleagues from across the Christian education world uh, today. And so thank you for the, the invitation. Uh, some things I've been trying to think about as I've been in touch with others all across the country uh, over the past five or six weeks is a reflection on the fact that this is a, a very strange time uh, filled with uncertainties, uh, things that we've never seen before. Your word of unprecedented, at least in our lifetime, is um, very accurate, I, I think. It's, it's a scary time for many people. Uh, we'll hear tomorrow probably that unemployment numbers will hit over 26 million, and that frightens people. And sadly, some of those are now from our campuses. As people have had to make <clears throat> some challenging decisions uh, this, this spring. Uh, it's, it's a sad time sickness everywhere. I mean, just, just 30 days ago, the death total in the United States was barely 300, and now it's well over 45,000. So, and that number just continues to climb. So, oh. you know, how, how do we deal with the sadness? We all know people that have uh, tested positive for the virus and had deaths in their family or on their campuses. And it's a very serious time. Um, many of our schools were already facing tremendous challenges. We felt challenges coming from every uh, direction. And this has only exacerbated it, it's multiplied it and compounded it. And so the challenges are very, very real, very, very serious. And so I've been re reminding people, let's live out of James chapter four, that uh, these are the things we will do if the Lord wills uh, in this time of uncertainty. This is not a cop out in any way. It's a recognition of our total dependence on God and a clinging to his faithfulness, to his providence, to the hope that we have in him during uh, this time. And I, I think living in a time of contingency uh, with uh, James 4 as our guideline is, is the way to navigate our way through this very difficult time. Barry? Yeah, uh, yeah. Thank you again, William, for um, uh, organizing this, and um, it's great to have um, warm-hearted uh, kindred spirits um, uh, on the panel here, as well as I'm um, sure many of you uh, we all know that are that are listening in. And misery does like company, doesn't it? Uh, um, <laughs> I want to I want to thank Shirley for the work that you're doing at CCCU, um, mm. advocating on our behalf in uh, in in Washington, and uh, your uh, emails and updates are are constant and so informative mm -hmm. and and uh david for your launching of iace and and the big picture work that you're doing across the spectrum of of, of christian education not just higher education um, just really grateful for you are um as many of, uh, of us have said in the president's chair you are a, uh, a kind of the the dean of presidents in christian higher education and the ways in which you have um infuse such wisdom into um, in, into all of our lives. And it's good to see uh, my friend Robert Sloan too and our, our kindred spirit down there in the other big city of Houston. We're in Los Angeles. And I've, I've been at Biola University now for 13 years in this role as president. And um, uh, in all my graduate work, I never took a, a course on pandemics in higher education. Um, <laughs> so this is new. Um, and uh, it's not like we can go to uh, my parents' generation and say, hey, what was it like when you went through that pandemic? And, uh, uh, in, in, in your world, because we have um, we have really no uh, current living models to go by. So this is uh, this is a new territory for all of us. And for our students, it's it's very painful, um, disruptive for them. Um, and they are now all studying at home or somewhere. And some of those circumstances aren't that great. It's 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 mm -hmm. crowded families with those in vulnerable conditions physically and limited internet access, whatever it might be. And so I, I just feel for those, I feel for our faculty who on a moment's notice have had to pivot uh, and, and, and change and on offer their courses um, mm -hmm. remotely um, with not much warning ahead of time. So there's a lot of us that are kind of processing 
this um, this certain degree of suffering, not to mention those that uh, David mentioned who are sick or are first responders or healthcare workers and 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 so many others. And you know, I, I, you know, just that the passage he, uh, David used the James passage for for me the uh, Romans five and when Paul says uh, a suffering leads to perseverance and it's easier to persevere when when you know when it's going to end, but we we don't know when this is going to end. And when it does end, it's going to like maybe gradually end and not suddenly. And, and then what's God t- telling us about perseverance and then perseverance um, leads to character. And, and it helps me to be attentive. God, what are you saying in my own life in terms of where I need my character to be developed and strengthened in ways that maybe I hadn't been attentive to as well. And then Paul says character leads to hope. And so the, the road from perseverance to hope, right. Is, has a couple of villages or way stations along the way. One is perseverance and one is character. And, and, you know, I'm out here just a couple of miles from Disneyland and I don't fast pass that journey from uh, suffering to hope without allowing those moments of perseverance and character to be um, learning lessons and deeply spiritual formation moments uh, uh, in our lives as well. Um, so maybe that's a little bit of, 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 of encouragement. I'm gonna talk about some practical encouragement uh, in a few minutes, uh, and so I come from the perspective of of uh, a Christian University. Biola um, is 6,000 students in Southern California, and non-denominational as a school. Prior to being here, I was at Gordon Conwell Seminary uh, for almost 16 years. Another non-denominational school, so we're um, I come from that perspective of of institutions of higher education, both at the graduate yeah. level and at the university level. Um, unaffiliated to a denomination, but profoundly and robustly and missionally biblical um, through and through. And um, if there's one thing that we cannot um, capitulate on during times like these, it's it's the, the deep core mission of our institutions. And it's easy for moments like these to to just veer us off course just a little bit in order to, to save the day, in order to make a good decision, in order to, you know, Kind of get into survival mode but uh, maybe another word of encouragement is like like fiercely protect your mission uh through this and the um the heart and soul of who you are uh, because that's what our world needs more than ever before especially uh in moments like these when the when the gospel is is really um really at work so i have some practical things um uh, brian and, and william i'll say for a little bit from now and i apologize at at, at 10 30 i have to bow out of this conversation but uh I'm anxious to hear what some of my other panelists have to say as well. Thank you. Shirley? It's a delight, uh, Brian and William, to be invited to be on this phone call. Thank thank you for your example of service. That is exactly what your firm is known for, and uh, we appreciate it. And we appreciate, uh, appreciate being part of the service opportunity to be with Robert, to be with David, to be with Barry. Uh, these are my heroes in higher education. I've been in higher education for 20 years, and uh, these are the individuals who have set the tone, the pace, and the excellence uh, across Christian higher education for many, many years. So it is an honor to be with you all. Uh, The CCCU is an organization that serves over 180 campuses around the world. So it's been interesting for us to know that the coronavirus is not just a U.S. problem. It's a Canadian problem. It's a Haiti problem. It's an Africa problem. It's an, an Asian problem. It's an Australian problem, and we've heard from all of our members what it looks like to be joined in a, in a united way against a fierce opponent and to see how their governments have done so well in various places. Um, and uh, I also think that there's never been a more time, a better time for us to uh, stretch our leadership. Uh, this is going to frame and to foster some of the best leadership that we've ever seen. And I just want to take a moment. We always see a partisan government uh, where they can't get things done. But I want us to take note and to give God thanks for the way in which our government has been working in a united way to uh, pass stimulus bills in a bipartisan way with the White House uh, in order to take care of the American people. And I think we need to remember this when there are times when there's such acrimony and when people say it can't be done, it can be done. And I'm very grateful for our leadership of our nation uh, for uh, setting forth priorities. So in particular, so that higher education can meet some of the losses, not all the losses. We're gonna keep asking for the right amount of money uh, so that higher education, which is the lifeblood of a democracy, 
uh, in order for us to continue to thrive, to employ people, and then to set out the next group of leaders. So um, it's a privilege to represent Christian higher education on the national level in all areas of, of government. Uh, we work every day, every day, every minute um, with Congress. We talk to the White House. We uh, file amicus briefs, all because, as Barry said, religious mission is so important. It's something that we cannot lose, and it's the hope of the world next to the church. Um, I've been, a, as, I, as I mentioned, I've been an educator, junior high school teacher, and then I was a lawyer, and then I've been in uh, advocacy for Christian education for 20 years. And the verse I want to share with people is um, I, about anxiety. Uh, I think our anxiety tolerance is rising, and that's because we're getting a lot of practice uh, around anxiety. But this is what the scripture says, as you all know, in Philippians 4, verse 6, do not be anxious about anything. And with prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, let your request be known to God. And I believe it. It is a faithful promise. And he says, in any situation, do not be anxious. I think we can name it and claim it uh, because that's the loving God we have. And he gave that to us thousands of years ago for just this time. So, William and uh, Brian, we'll let it back to you to ask some questions. Uh, yes, thank you. But uh, Robert, why don't you uh, introduce yourself and then we'll we'll roll. Thank you. Uh, my name is Robert Sloan. I've been in Christian higher education for, well, David has really uh, made me think about that because he and I met, uh, it was the very first class I ever taught in 1980. I was a very young professor and he was a very old student. <laughs> No, we, we have known each other for 40 years. It goes back to 1980, uh, Southwestern Seminary. And uh, so I've been in Christian higher education that long and um, been a university uh, administrator uh, for, oh my goodness, I don't know, 28 years, I think, something like that. I've been a college president for 25 years. I'm uh, at Houston Baptist University now and have been for uh, 14 years. It's hard to believe it's been that long, but it has been 14 years. Uh, uh, it's like Barry uh, mentioning living in a large city. I, I have the privilege of being in a, in a great city and it, it's, uh, it's quite a, a, a different experience, I think, to do um, evangelical or Protestant Christian higher education in a major city. We have, of course, a lot of Catholic universities mm -hmm in major cities, but that's pretty unusual uh, for a, a Protestant or evangelical university to be in a major city. So that it's very dynamic, it's very exciting, and um, it's uh, uh, very, very challenging as, as with all of you. So uh, HBU is about, we have about 3,700 students. We have a robust uh, online program of well over a thousand uh, students now. Uh, the university is 60 years old. We we had a lot of 60-year anniversary celebrations planned this year, uh, most wow. of which have uh, had to be uh, done in a different kind of way. Um, but uh, at any rate, we're a comprehensive university, started off as a four-year liberal arts school, but now a comprehensive university with a few doctoral programs and over 40 uh, master's uh, programs. Uh, so um, anyway, very, very thankful for the opportunity to, to serve. and. Um, the, one of the, uh, of course, a lot of uh, texts come to mind. Um, the uh, one of the things I thought about uh, was uh, is is Romans eight, where uh, Paul, you know, refers to social tumults uh, and mm. uh, and so on, and says, uh, you know, what can separate us from the love of Christ, and gives a whole list of war and poverty and social unrest and so on. But nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ. That's right. The 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 other text that comes to mind and that we've talked about has to do, I think, in some ways with leadership and, and where all of us are. It's it's a time um, for for hope, uh, but it's in, in, and in that hope it is a time for transparency. And those things go together. Second uh, Corinthians one eight, Paul says, "I would not have you ignorant, fellow Christians." of the affliction which came to us in Asia, that we were burdened excessively beyond our strength so that we despaired even of life. Uh, but God who raises, so that we should not trust in ourselves, but in God who raises the dead. Uh, he uh, has rescued us from so great a peril of death and indeed he will rescue us and he will yet That's rescue right. us. That's good. That's right. Very good.
Thank you, Robert. All very good words of encouragement. Thank you very much. Um, let's dive into some questions. I, we've we've been navigating crisis response, damage control, and now a number of you have mentioned one of the hardest things about this crisis is we just don't know when the end will come. And so we're all navigating this kind of moment by moment. We now know it's uh, all but most likely uh, institutions won't be back, quote, in session, in person till the fall at the earliest. And that's still a big question mark. But as we look towards what will the fall semester look like, Barry, I want to throw this actually your way first, because you're, you're in a pretty hot spot there. Um, if, if families are going to be returning to campus in the fall, what sort of promises can institutions be making when it comes to health and safety of the campus, of the workplace, um, and, and what sort of messaging are you sending across now and, and do you plan to in the future? Yeah, uh, thanks, Brian. Um, maybe maybe my, uh, my best response is that um, um, we are in Christian higher education in such a good place to, uh, to care for students when they do come back. Uh, we're not this like this big factory like machine uh, we we care about the whole person, their their mind, their body, their soul, their relationships, their vocation, their calling, their identity, and this is this is a chance for um, I think Christian higher education to really flourish and rise to the occasion. Um, uh, it's I think as we all do our planning, we've got to be really careful because I, unless there's a vaccine, there are going to be certain protocols in place on our campuses when okay. we do open up. Hopefully. Um, uh, in the in the fall, um, and those protocols might have to do with with distancing. We might have to have classes that have fewer people, farther apart, uh, more sessions. We might have to take chapel and do it in um, small groups in different kinds of ways, and not gathering. Our spectator sports um, might have to have different ways in which our you know our fans are are viewing um, these sports, mm -hmm. whatever it, it might be. We might have to hire additional um, uh, uh, custodial. Um, team members to make sure that like we are like diligent about sanitation and hygiene across our campus. Um, we might have to have temperature testing regularly and and um, and and uh, treatment certainly for uh, those who have become uh, maybe tested positive. Regular testing. I think um, our our community, our of parents and students, need to know that we are going to do all we can to be able to make adjustments and be very agile. So let's say a student is taking a physics class, um, that student um, isn't feeling well, test positive. Where's our quarantined residence for that student so that for two weeks that student can take all of his or her classes and receive meals and then come back into the classroom without having to go home and drop out of the semester. So the agility that it's calling on all of us as leaders to really be prepared for any number of scenarios um mm -hmm. is, is pretty uh, extraordinary uh right now but also the uh, the mental health care the physical health care the spiritual care that we have an opportunity to provide to students when they come back to our campuses i think it's just a remarkable moment for us to be actually at our best and at our finest and do something that frankly other colleges and universities aren't doing like 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 these faith-based deeply christian universities are so, you know, this is, a, you know, as people have often said, don't let a crisis go to waste. This is our opportunity to not only strengthen our mission through this, but also what are some new ways in which we're going to be able to provide education um, to get rid of, you know, not that the playbook's out the window, but get, getting rid of some of the things that like we've been like hanging on to too long. Um, and this major disruption, as all of us know we're going through, is going to help us re-engineer our colleges and universities as we get through this to what I believe can be some of our most flourishing and fruitful days ahead. I'm, you know, I, I, when I'm not like, like worrying about these immediate crises, um, um, yeah. decisions I have to make and you zoom back, like there's some great opportunities for us to, to truly be at our finest in Christian higher education. And that is, that is profoundly hopeful for, for, for us and, and an encouragement to all of us. Barry, that's such a good word. And I, uh, you know, couldn't agree more. I'm very bullish on how the church in general responds to crisis, and and Christian higher education is part of the church, big C. Okay. You just can't find a time in history when there's external pressure applied to the church and the church doesn't flourish. So uh, very bullish. But I'm I'm wondering, 
Uh, I was reading uh, a report yesterday out of uh, Southern Seminary and Dr. Moeller, who's been quite visionary for being able to see things before they happen. And they've got a huge residential uh, attendance and yet their plan moving forward in trying to be faithful is anticipating real budget cuts. And, and I, I don't think it's any secret to people on the call today that Christian higher education has not had a fun time with budgeting over the last 10 years. So I wanna just like put Robert and Barry right on the spot. Are you guys having to anticipate budget cuts already? Robert, what, why don't you kick us off? Sure, absolutely. Uh, it's a very serious matter. We have, we have done modeling based upon a 15% decline in student enrollments on a 25% uh, decline and on a 40% decline. So we've, we've modeled all that out. Of course, it affects a room board books, fees, housing, et cetera, <clears throat> auxiliary enterprises, uh, event management. And so it's, it's a, it's a huge uh, budgetary issue. So, uh, and you know, being here in Houston, not only do we have the, uh, just the economic fallout from all the unemployment, I mean, the numbers are, are terrible, but of course, now that we have, you know, $10 a barrel oil and oil futures dipped to below zero, Houston's an energy mm -hmm. town and that has a, massive ripple effect economically negatively on our on our families so right now it's so interesting because our our student recruiting funnel is matching last year last year was an all-time record for us and yet wow. how people feel today when they're making deposits and sending in applications and how they will feel when it comes time actually end of august to in, enroll and come to class and move in and that sort of thing uh, and, and obviously the economic fallout is going to get worse before it gets better. So uh, there, there's a, we're, we're anticipating a significant, uh, all of it comes together, even, even the 15% enrollment decline for us comes, amounts to a 17% revenue decline. And, um, you know, it just means, uh, as Barry was saying, we've, we've, we've got to be innovative. There are a lot of things that we've got to do. Higher education is not known for, being highly adaptable but i do think that honestly that the the christian institutions uh, have been much more adaptable for all kinds of social cultural political and legal reasons so there there's a lot we can do and it has to do with instruct a lot of things barry mentioned with instruction delivery and adaptability and um, and it, it's an opportunity to to this thing has will accelerate the changes that frankly that's right needed to happen for over a decade or more and this is going to accelerate that and so to that extent it's a good thing but accreditation accreditation is it's you know it's slow and it 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 uh, but it, but it's it has become more adaptive recently uh, for various reasons and will have to be even more adaptive uh, so all all kinds of uh, i think things have to be done my heart goes out to you robert we're we're down the road from you in houston and i think i saw one of my neighbors filling their pool with crude oil just to try and store it somewhere right now it's not a fun time in texas but know, they, they got yeah. caught in the short squeeze and took delivery <laughs> i'm saying you know i might as well put it somewhere it's negative right now uh, yeah. now, now, Barry, answer the same question as a president, acting president of university. Mm -hmm. What are you doing budgetarily to prepare for this? Yeah, so there's not much more I can add to uh, Robert's uh, very articulate explanation of what I think all of us are going through. Um, um, a few things like, like uh, they are doing at Houston Baptist, we are in the constant mode of scenario planning. And we don't know what the fall is going to look like, but with like great help from the wide range of teams we have on our campus, we're drafting these data-driven contingencies based on any number of potential outcomes. And we're doing it with like surgical detail. So that not, not just hypothetically, but like what happens if, um, if we are down 10% or 15% or 5% or if we're, you know, if the government says you have to remain um, sheltered in place for the fall semester and you can't, you have to offer things remotely. All of that needs like excruciating detail, lots of people working on it. And that, that kind of attention we're giving to um, our contingency planning. Um, secondly, just, and I know all of you are doing this as well, like treating your, your very anxious employees with like Christian dignity and fairness right now, because you're making decisions um, as uh, um, someone mentioned, I think it was uh, David mentioned about uh, Southern Seminary and, 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 and their public decisions about 30% uh, uh, cut in revenues and expenses that like the, some of these decisions, they affect people. 
and how are we minimizing the impact that this crisis has on our faculty and staff? And the best gift that we can give to them is, is truth and grace and frequency and communication. And we've been doing um, every week a, a full all community conversation. So we have six, seven, 800 um, of our employees on the line uh, every Friday afternoon for about an hour, just answering their questions that they submit earlier and, 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 and being as clear as possible and not sugarcoating anything and making sure that um, there's no vacuum in their in communication because they people can fill vacuum with worst case imagining and so that's what we do and as i said earlier we're first and foremost you know we're committed to uh, our mission maybe a couple other things that we're doing um is that we're like all of us like we're trying to keep an access to cash liquid assets and and stewarding this really well uh through this period we're going through this is our missional responsibility and um, and we're we're looking at every opportunity to make sure that we have the cash to be able to um, continue forward um, um, in a way that is uh, wise and and resourceful and a good steward of of our resources. And that demands a lot of of attention and some difficult choices as well. Um, and between the um, the contingency planning and the preservation of resources. It is no choice but to um, uh, put us in a place where we have to be more nimble. And it's actually a word that I think a lot of us use in higher education, but we don't always take that posture. And and we need to maybe be able to make decisions as, as information comes from government authorities and other sources. How are we going to course correct and uh, reflect and assess and make or change a decision for the well being of the university and which scenario to pursue, as, as Robert talked about? And, you know, finally, I think this is a, important that this is a moment to strengthen and reimagine us for the future and if we don't do that we're really squandering this crisis and um so we've charged our teams with not only making recommendations but what do we need to consider what long-term changes not just to get over this hump but what do we need to do to graft into the culture of viola going forward and and we're hearing some like remarkable ideas as we empower these teams about transforming this crisis into an opportunity it's really a unique time and um, this is a moment really to pivot in areas where maybe we've you know, dragged our feet or been too busy and, and not to be timid in our ideas, but like how do we thrive through this major global disruption? And, and um, a lot of that has to do with how we're responding, not just to the fall, but beyond the fall as well. And so maybe that's a little bit of a broader context, William, to your question, but oh. uh, a little bit of what we're doing because Robert said so much of what, um, uh, all of us are thinking about on a on a daily basis um, in this current moment. Well, I think I think, and, and I, I'm not a clairvoyant, but I think you, the Christian education world. I, I'm a guy that just has a hammer, so everything looks like a nail. So I think about staffing issues, right? I think that higher education that excels through this will begin to look for a new kind of skill set when they're interviewing for staff people and and we're studying that and trying to figure that out fortunately we had to do that on the church end back when multi-site started mm -hmm. and the internet disrupted church quicker than than education one follow-up question for you barry because i know you got to go in 10 minutes so i'm a parent right now uh, i've got a christian secondary school a uh, child downstairs who hadn't been to school in six weeks and i'm currently paying for her meal plan and I'm like, I'm not getting any food out of that meal plan, and <laughs> there's no plan to get it back. So are you guys facing questions from parents or families that are kind of struggling to make sure they can pay for education? How are you pastoring to them, and what are the real answers you're giving them? And then we'll kick it around there, but I wanna, I wanna hear from you first, Barry, since you've gotta go. Yeah, well, I'm, I actually raised my hand, William, when you said you were the only one on this call that was a parent of a CCCU student, because. I'm there as well. We have um, two that have graduated from CCC institutions and one that's currently a junior um, who is now studying uh, at home with us and he happens to be a Biola student. So I get to see firsthand what it's like to be both a parent and a president uh, going through uh, this crisis as well. You know, I, I'm, our, our, our parents and our students have been just heroic through all of this, very patient and, uh, and long suffering and willing again to make the changes necessary uh, of course, we are, you know, prorating whatever room and board they had to forfeit as they went home early, and giving them an opportunity to receive that as a credit or as um, uh, as a check back uh, to them. Um, 
but at the same time that I don't, I don't think that 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 um, forbearance and that patience is going to continue on we can't just say well you know if we have to go on for indefinite amount of time um, and which I don't anticipate happening but in a, in a remote we've got to we've got to adjust the costs we've got to uh, increase the quality we've got to make sure that um, that what we're offering to our students is something so good and so affordable in this disruptive time that they're not saying well we're just going to go and take our classes at a community college and and uh, and just um do the cheaper path until you know you know the school comes up and going again but it, it's actually the affordability question and the sustainability of business models in higher education has been uh crescendoing uh for years now and uh, this has just accelerated it. And in, unless we're thinking about how do we provide the quality education without compromising our mission in affordable ways to provide an education that prepares students not just for a job right out of college, but for a life uh, for decades to come, um, this, this is forcing us to answer those questions um, much more quickly um, because parents are demanding of it. The, 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 the debt rate is unsustainable for our students to take on. And, as Shirley said, so grateful for the federal government for providing some relief uh, to students who have borrowed money right now and, and are having trouble trying to figure out how to pay back those bills. But we've got to address all of these in short order uh, in order to flourish through this moment and re-engineer ourselves. So, you know, the question we've been asking is not when do we get back to normal, but what is our new normal? The question we've been asking is not how do we get through this, but what do we learn through this? And um, and our parents and our and our students, they deserve that of us in this moment. Communication with them is key, keeping them informed. But we've got to make some changes uh, in the way in which we're doing business. Um, and this is a moment that's causing us all to think about that in a in a very short order fashion. Yeah, that's good. Thank you so much for all of your words of wisdom so far. I'm gonna. I, I want us to come back actually in a little in a little bit about what do we need to be considering for leaders moving into this future that Barry's describing. Um, Shirley, I want you to respond with something specific here. And David, I'm going to tee you up to talk about working with boards in moments like this. But Shirley, um, responding to what you're hearing across uh, institutions, uh, following up with, with what Barry or Robert said, and then specifically, what should institutions be considering about this question of reopening when it comes to federal, state, and local guidance that's just is all over the map right now? Mute. We lost Shirley's voice. Shirley, where's Shirley? Uh, we had we had some construction going on outside my house, and I didn't want to interrupt the other uh, folks as they were talking. Uh, well, first and foremost, we know that there's going to be more costs, and so there's going to be a stimulus for uh, brought before Congress. Uh, higher education and the CCCU works closely with the American Council on Education and the National uh, Association of Independent Colleges and Universities and others. We're going to ask for $49 billion more uh, because a change doesn't happen overnight. So um, when uh, Barry and David and Robert are talking about the need for change, uh, it's a long process. It's a marathon and not a sprint. And so how do you sustain both giving education, you know, uh, making sure that that's delivered well, while making changes and innovations that's going to have to be supported? So the first thing we're asking for is another $47 billion. We've heard already that the Congress has an appetite for 20 billion. And so that um, margin between 20 and 47 billion dollars is what we're gonna be working towards. The second thing is, um, I do think that there is some value in having local government deciding when things should open. Because uh, to, have, to have one size fits all in this particular moment probably isn't going to help the individual nature of the states and their individual experiences. That being said, I think that the government has to provide the medical oversight. So that is something that shouldn't be delegated to the state so that one state does have vaccines and uh, testing and another state doesn't. And I, I do see that the government is working towards that with vigor, but I think it's been too slow. And so in order for us to open well, we're going to have to have a national policy of good testing. And, I, and the vaccine will be here maybe in a year or 18 months, but in between time, and I'm not gonna repeat what the others have said, we're gonna to have to do those things. Um, and uh, I also think that we need to bring together our donors for an innovation and recovery fund. 
Um, I've already reached out to one of the CCCU donors, and he's, this donor is a, uh, this foundation has been a donor to many of our uh, campuses. They love our campuses, and we've made a, a ask to say, could you be a lead donor for an innovation and recovery set of conversations? To, to exactly to the point that the, the presidents here on the phone have said, we've got to get together and really do the thinking why the crisis is fresh. It's good, it's very good. Uh, David, I want to toss it your way for any additional thoughts, and then specifically, I know, I know you led through a, a substantial crisis um, at Union, and and mm -hmm. it wasn't just a a, a week long thing. You led through that crisis for some time. So yeah. so, what do you have to offer? And then specifically, what should institutions be thinking about as they work specifically with their boards, because it's it's going to be a while as we work through this. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you, Brian, That's for that uh, question. I do think there is uh, a relationship. Um, as some of you know, February of 2008, uh, the Union University campus was hit with a devastating uh, tornado. Uh, it caused $45 million worth of damage in 45 seconds. And um, wow. it was uh, just the, the largest natural disaster to ever hit a North American campus uh, at that time. And uh, it, we were at a, a point where we wondered if there was a future, if there was a tomorrow uh, for a Union University. Uh, but it was working with our board, I think, that was the key to navigating uh, that way forward. So I think there is a, a tie-in. So I would strongly encourage uh, campus leaders to be of one mind and one heart uh, with their boards right now to be communicating uh, clearly, regularly, uh, on a, on a, you know, communicate well to make sure that to what you're thinking is what they're thinking and how they're going to support how you're going to, to move ahead. One of the differences between now and then is that we were responding to something that had happened as uh, traumatic as it was uh, by midnight on uh, February the 5th, 2008, the tornado was done. And uh, so we were looking back to that event and then responding to it. And we responded every minute of every day for mm -hmm. years uh, to, to move out of that particular time. But right now, everyone is responding in the midst of an ongoing uh, crisis. Uh, there's no end to it yet. So we can't turn back and we're, we're still trying to navigate through the uncertainty. So that makes navigating through this crisis different than that. But other than, there are still some, some uh, parallels. And I think, first of all, the most important thing is to, to assess where you are. You know, if, if, leader, if leadership is uh, both giving hope in the midst of a difficulty, it is defining reality in the midst of, of difficulty. And so I think uh, assessing where you are, defining reality for everyone, uh, recognize the need to care for the community, particularly to provide care for students. Uh, this is a time for leaders to put on their pastoral care hat, give a great deal of attention to faculty and staff uh, who are dealing with anxiety that's bouncing off the roof and uh, to address that uh, in a very caring, uh, biblical, spiritual, uh, pastoral way. Uh, to, to have an immediate uh, understanding of what you need to do you know, tomorrow, what you need to do in the next two weeks, what you need to do in the next month. So have some very short-term goals and then to develop some longer-term goals. And those have to have some, I think, multiple scenarios because as you move forward, you, you'll gain some more clarity, but right now that uh, is, is a little bit vague and, and is filled with ambiguities. Uh, but you can have some multiple scenarios. So as I think as you think about the fall, you work with boards and say, do we, uh, will we be able to come back on campus? Will we be in an online virtual learning situation? Or is it, will it be a hybrid situation? Or, or do we need to recreate the academic calendar, which I think is something that's going to come out of this. And we're going to move short-term courses, more four-week modules, Semesters will be seven or eight week sessions. 
Uh, and I think that even for this fall, if you can pull that off so that if you can start, uh, you can be on campus. If you need to pull off at the end of seven weeks, you can can uh, go back to the uh, online module or start off campus and then call people on in the middle of campus if you can can do that. So I think having some short term goals and then some longer term goals. And then I think to be thinking that the vaccine's not going to happen for 18 to 24 months. We need to be thinking in terms of the two year runway on right. how we navigate through this. And this is a, a pivotal time for Christian higher education. Every institution will write their history in terms of pre-COVID-19 and post-COVID-19. This is not just a, a little break. This, this is a change no. for us. This is a, this is a paradigmatic change that will affect who we are and where we're going uh, for years and years to come. So okay. crisis management is very significant. It calls for resiliency. It calls for wisdom. Mm -hmm. It calls for innovation. Mm -hmm. It calls for a great deal of collaboration and teamwork and great communication, faithful, regular communication with boards. The institution can go no further in this than the board will allow them to go. So the, the role of the president and the board is vital for each institution and probably no more important than it's ever been in the history of most institutions. That's good. David, thing. thanks so much. Barry, I, I know you've got to go and I want to honor your time. Thank you so much for joining us. Appreciate it. Thanks for hosting this. Bye-bye, everybody. Yes. Hi, Barry. Uh, Robert, let me let me throw a question your way. I want to. We've got some great questions coming in, but I think of the, the uh, people that have been on the panel and other people that I talked to. And it, forgive me if I have the wrong assumption, but I think you might have a higher commuter population than, say, uh, a, a purely residential college or university. Are you foreseeing uh, commuters? Are, are you having to think about them any differently when it comes to the fall? As opposed to a purely residential campus. Yes, our uh, our under, we have more residential students than people realize. It's usually surprising. We're we're about 43% uh, of our undergraduates are residential, but obviously a, a large number are, are commuters. So yes, I what we are planning for. I, I think the trend line is clear that uh, that you're going to see more online registrations. Uh, you're going to see uh, and and then you're going to see because what we've learned in this uh, is that is that uh, you know the cost curve has to change, the efficiencies have to come in that we've talked about. Both tr traditional faculty and traditional students have both had a, a barrier broken because our traditional faculty have learned, hey, I can do this, um, and uh, and so there's there's a greater willingness to to do to use technology and do remote delivery. I've, I've heard some faculty members say, you know, I've had to develop some new materials for classes and courses that even if I go back to a traditional lecture hall will greatly enhance that experience as well. Students, more students have realized too that, hey, this this online stuff isn't isn't all that bad. And uh, so we are we are planning on seeing the ratio of our uh, traditional students versus online students. We're planning on seeing that ratio continue to move towards uh, the electronic delivery the 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 online now i this this connects with the, the kinds of things that uh, david was talking about earlier as well and, and Shirley as well in terms of of having to uh, have some innovation funding and and in terms of, of uh, mm -hmm. having some innovation uh some some time to work with boards and so on in some of the academic changes that david was talking about I think we need to be thinking about, we've talked a long time in higher ed about a three-year degree, a three-year bachelor's degree, but what about a 110-hour mm -hmm. degree? What about a 115 mm -hmm. degree? What about a 10, I'm sorry, a three-year uh, bachelor's degree? I think flattening our organizational structures, uh, finding, doing, uh, flattening our academic structures, those are the kinds of things at least we've got to think about. Now, they can't be done overnight. But we've got to think about those. And that's where it's so important to have groups like IACE and CCCU who can advocate for us, not only with the government, but also with the accrediting bodies. And, and they pull us all together to work together because there's some of these tasks that we can do as individual universities, but we need one another to, to do together. Mm -hmm. Seminars that, that you know help us learn from one another. I've seen more 
information sharing amongst professionals uh, in the last five and a half weeks than I have at any other time in my career. Uh, we always talk about, oh yeah, you know, we get together. Listen, let me tell you, college presidents don't get together on the phone that much and talk. Uh, it's just not true. But, I, but I've seen a lot of space made for information sharing through professional organizations that uh, are, are, you know, collaborative coalitions and so on that uh, that gather information and then and then put it out. We have used that tremendously in the last five and a half weeks. I've, our people get on, you know, phones and zooms and go tos and so on to uh, to to get the kind of quick executive summary information we need to to transition. So. Uh, yeah, I, I see. Uh, I see a lot of things uh, in the offing uh, that, that we need to think about. And, and Robert, to follow up with that, uh, you know, that's a lot of change all at once. And and I know right now we're talking about cost cutting and freezing hiring. And I do want to hear what you guys are doing with that. But but when we gather together, education is not going away, right? I mean, and the right. virus will. Uh, there's never been another time in human history when the entire global medical community is focused on one solution. So I'm I'm going to believe that we'll have a solution quicker than people uh, might might like to think. Uh, but irrespective, it's going to come back when all these changes happen. It sounds like a whole new skill set in hiring. Have any of you, and I'll start with Robert, thought about what that means? Like, how are you going to interview differently for somebody that can make those pivots? No question about it. Uh, you know, we I've interviewed for these criteria in recent years more so, but it's it it, it won't just be window dressing uh, in the process. I, we have to be now. This is an old point, but we've got to be. Barry mentioned this earlier. We've got to be really focused on our mission because there are a lot of things that when you get into a crisis, uh, people start giving up on certain principles out of uh, expedience, and we've seen this frankly, in some ways on religious freedom. Uh, so, I mean, there, there are some precedents that have been set that concern me about religious freedom. That's, that's, uh, that's another topic. Uh, but yes, uh, we, we've got to have people clearly committed to our mission. We've got to have people who are highly adaptive, people who are, are familiar with, are willing to learn more about uh, technology. I look for people who, um, you, you don't want the traditional divide between a traditional, uh, faculty role and quote online. Now those are two cultures and whenever you bring online onto a campus there is a culture clash and there's even an ideological you know difficulty. That is being broken down and we've got to, we've got to continue to see that that breakdown. Relationships, we know relationships matter. I mean there's there's no question all the research on learning shows that there is a relational dimension uh, to learning that that um, that is is necessary people people just learn in a different way learning from a, a screen they can learn that way but learning from grandmother's knee and you know listening to stories and 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 there, we, people learn different ways so it means that the online also has to figure out what is there in the traditional relational experience that has got to be uh incorporated not just the techniques but what what can be incorporated and, and transferred into into the online experience? So, yeah, I mean, I I I think the vaccine will be here uh, sooner than people uh, predict, just because there's such a focus on this. But we're going to have to do a lot of testing, uh, and and that's that's really what what has got to be done, and all the implications of that for for starting up starting up in the fall. But but I, I look for adaptability. I look for mission centeredness. Uh, I, I think we have to have people um, who who are willing to uh, work in a different in a different kind of environment. I think we've got to rethink how we the criteria for promotion, how we do uh, how we do research. Research is absolutely important because it's a long term thing that that institutions do. So you can't give up on that. But we've got to figure out what are the other modalities for delivering research besides just going through a professional journal, et cetera, et cetera. Well, I think it's going to be a fascinating conversation. I think you're going to need people who are bilingual between the online learning mm. versus the traditional. I think it's going to raise fascinating questions about tenure. I mean, if the world's going to change this fast and all your faculty is there for good no matter what, is that is that really a viable model for the next 20, 30, 40 years? But I'm going to get in hot water with everybody if I talk about that for too long. So, uh, uh, Brian, I'll kick it to you. 
Yeah, I'm going to I'm going to shift us a little bit toward we have just amazing questions coming in. And uh, the first one, I do want to toss to Shirley as she's again had conversations with institutions across the CCTU. Any specific insights that you have or you're hearing for schools with majority minority student bodies? Mm. This is a great question. It is really about the future of Christian higher education. The future of higher education is to understand our diverse families. So I think that this would be an um, extraordinary time to, to get into the data and into the churches uh, that have Hispanic serving churches, African American serving churches, and ask what are your families going through? What do your students of color who are going to college what do they need? And, and it would be very important not to treat everybody like the, uh, the traditional student that we may have seen. And CCCU schools have diversified significantly over the last 10, 15 years. We've just published an advanced magazine on it. But the key is understanding what the families need and then responding, especially in a high stress time, to uh, being very individualized about what they may have gone through. They may have had parents um, or supporting individuals who have lost work. And this is what the government did give the student cares money for, for the most needy students, if those are those most needy students. But it is going to take an intentional effort. I love the question because I think we can, in a time of crisis, kind of lump everybody together, but we cannot lose the gains we have on our diversity work in Christian higher education. That's good. Um, David, I want to toss this one to you. Somebody asked, um, what, what new metrics might we want to start thinking about to track institutional strength? So historically, we focused on things like housing registration, class registration deposits. Are we, should we be thinking of new metrics to be using? So I'm sure we're going to have to rethink how we measure uh, the changes that will be implemented. So I think that's definitely the case. But the, before I answer, let me just say how much I appreciate uh, Shirley's attention to policy issues and to diversity issues. She's been a champion in both of those areas and having her voice in this conversation today is very important uh, for everyone to, to be able to, to hear. Uh, but I, uh, I, I'm quite sure that uh, Institutional Effectiveness uh, Office Will become even more important on, on campuses as we do institutional research, how we, we think about how we measure it, um, how, how we think about um, what is quality, um, and perhaps some of our older biases will need to go away uh, in, in that regard. Because as, as Robert said, there's been a change in, in that we're all online educators and virtual learners now and uh, whatever cloud may have been over uh, that uh, delivery system has uh, at least evaporated for the moment and I think probably for the long term as we become more hybrid institutions even as we're able to come back to, to class and able to come back to campus but our camp we have recruited I, I have for preview days uh, you know six times a year for almost a quarter of a century, I would stand up and talk about the importance of community and relationships and bonding and, and things that are vital to, to our kind of institutions. And, and it goes against every aspect of social distancing. Uh, and so, so we're going to have to rethink how do we do social distancing? How do we recreate this sense of community, this sense of belonging? the sense of identity? How do we strengthen relationships and still carry on our work in, in a different way? I mean, classrooms are probably, if they have 40 seats in them, you're gonna have no more than 20 students in the, in, in the class. The dining hall is gonna, instead of having six students around a, a table with six chairs, they'll have six chairs with three students around that uh, table or maybe just two. Uh, and so creating a different kind of dynamic and relationships and so, a lot of our measurements were not just quantitative ones, head count to FTE to retention to, you know, dollars invested per student, but we tried to do some qualitative measurements. And I think we're going to have to change both of the qualitative and the quantitative uh, measurements and thinking about a different 
kind of a different way of, of doing campus. Uh, it, that we're not going back to what was normal. We're, we're in a new day and, and it's going to be different going forward. Good. Um, uh, Robert, I'm gonna throw this your way as you get ready to navigate an institution through this. Somebody asked, how do you prevent silos uh, amongst the staff and faculty when you're making difficult decisions about organizational structure mm. and changes in the institution? Mm. You know, it's all it's all about communication, and you know this has actually been one of the uh, blessings I think that has come out of this crisis, and that is that uh, we've had to make so many decisions about new protocols and new policies and new ways of doing thing things that it requires it's required you know a lot more uh, interaction, even though it hasn't been in person uh, with memos and uh, and uh, you know teleconferencing and so on. Uh, and, and, and computer uh, communication, electronic communication. So it, it's really very interesting. Silos are a function, uh, particularly, uh, are, are often closely related to place. And wow. so, so once, because our places are changing, just by the very fact of that, people will know more about what happens. There'll be more work or more more operationally or work oriented as opposed to place oriented for example i mean uh i, I know when i first became a dean um i had never to speak of i was on a, a large campus i'd never been much out of my own space yeah. into the football stadium and been to the basketball arena yeah. and been in my de department but once i became an administrator i had to think about bigger questions and bigger issues about right. the whole university and certainly when you become a president that's the most frightening thing of all is that you've got all of these issues you've got police and water and utilities and, and and a clinic and a library and all of these these things well well these when, when you have to get people together in new task forces to discuss problems and you do so electronically they're not limited by the person in the yeah. office next to them it's it's the technology that brings them together and so people see more how one decision affects people all across the spectrum so we have now a wider knowledge for all staff members and all faculty members about the total workings of the university and and that's a blessing mm -hmm. uh, another great question when when we think about reopening uh, somebody's asking how do you provide mutual lament uh, while also caring for those mm. leading and being committed to the mission of the organization? Uh, so there's going to be a lot of emotions happening. How do we navigate emotionally through this? Brian, I'd like to jump in that. Yeah, I, surely go ahead. Yeah, yeah. I, I'll be short because I, I want to hear what David and Rob, Robert have to say about that. Um, I would just say that you can't go too fast. Um, and so there's got to be a real naming of the lament that has happened for all the loss. I'll turn it over to David. Yeah, I was, I was exactly right. You, we can't rush through this. And uh, we have, we have, this is where I said earlier, uh, leaders are going to have to put their pastoral care hat on and it's going to be very intentional and purposeful and very thoughtful. Um, reflective and and realize the, the the genuine pain that some people have experienced uh, in uh, the midst of this but we have we have to allow people to go through this and walk with them through it while providing hope at the same time so that the institution uh, can be forward uh, looking uh, and hopefully the combination of those two things creates a, a new resiliency uh, for all of us uh, to uh, navigate the way forward yeah, I, you know, it's interesting. I the first that was my first thought as well is that both Shirley and David have said you have to you cannot rush lament. Lament takes time. You've got to let people mm -hmm. have time and opportunity to lament. And not and I would say I would say this one of the couple of the strategies. Uh, w well, one is time, and so just acknowledge it. You know, Paul says I would not have you ignorant about the affliction which came to me in Asia. So we we talk about it. We're transparent about it. Uh, the the other is you can give structure. Worship together is very important. And the the the, the book called mm. Lamentations in the Bible is the most tightly structured book. Mm. All of its alphabetic structures, 
And I think the reason for that is is to give stru- so that the wail mm. has to be loud and long is nonetheless not chaotic. It doesn't descend into chaos. It's it's got uh, it's got some some structure to shape it and form it. It's it's done within a community. So I think worshiping together is very important. The other thing I would say is that, and David and, and Shirley both mentioned this, that you you don't end with lament. You give it plenty of time and space. And you have to maybe cycle back to it, uh, which is what the poems do in Lamentations. But you still, you don't end with it. The most unremitting lamentation, I think, apart from the book of Lamentations uh, in, in scripture is Psalm 88. And even Psalm 88, which doesn't end with the typical, but still I will trust in the Lord. It doesn't even end that way. It begins nonetheless with, Oh Yahweh, the God of my salvation. That's the way it starts. Good. So it's the it, it's a it's a reminiscence of the story of the covenant God, the cry of Jesus on the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Is nonetheless the cut the cry of the to the covenant God, my God, my God. So it's it's Yahweh, the God of our history, of our remembrance, of our story. So um Anyway, it's, if you give it enough time and structure, and and you, it will finally, I believe, issue forth in hope. I, I, I couldn't agree more, and I, I hate to jump in as an education expert, but I see a cross here uh, in our work with churches. So I, right. one of my friends in town who, Robert, you would know, who's a good pastor of a decent church, it, it's not a huge church, he's scared to death right now that his whole congregation has learned how to Netflix the best preaching in the world, and so he's going to get left behind once we can all meet together. And I said to him, listen, man, that's yeah. not the case. I, I think something's going to happen in churches. And this, I think there's a translation education. I think instead of uh, people will go to the church, mm-hmm. uh, they will follow the, 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 the preacher who's the best. They're going to follow the pastor who's the best. I think the priestly skills are going to go through the roof because I think now we can get education anywhere. So it's really going to be the relational and the ability to put on that pastoral hat, whether it's from a distance learning or an on-site. And I think that's going to change hiring a little bit. Uh, and, and it will be that room for lament. And then uh, Robert knows that that one of the key guys after my conversion is a professor he hired at a school he previously served called Ralph Wood. Uh, and Ralph's got a book out <laughs> called The Comedy of Redemption. Uh, we live in a comedy, not a tragedy. Uh, we've seen act three of the play, it's the crux, and it has happened, and we know the ending is good. And I think that uh, without being Pollyannish, the, the professors, the provosts, mm-hmm. the student life that can come in allowing room for that lament, yeah. but build a relational right. bridge is gonna create a unique, holistic learning experience that uh, uh, w- can't be replaced. I, I think that might be, uh, there's more questions, but we're going to try and respond to those because uh, I want to respect uh, everybody's time. I am so thankful uh, for the time you spent in your day uh, in the midst of, I know, all of the other busy uh, agendas that you all have going on. I'm just, I'm in awe. I appreciate all of you. Uh, I'm deeply grateful. I know William wants to share a word as we wrap up and then uh, we'll all log off. So. Well, just one, uh, we talked about metrics. Uh, just so you guys know, I'm learning how to do webinars like everybody else. And the number of people who registered for this right in the dead middle of the day is off the charts. And then the number of people who actually showed up is really ridiculous. And we've had virtually nobody leave. So uh, you all, you have made a good investment of time and I appreciate it. And and you, everybody started with a verse of encouragement, which I so appreciate. But I'll tell you, I think the verse that uh, has come to my mind when I see people like I remember being in Shirley's office not too long ago and seeing David at his office. I, I think it when Paul wrote the Roman church and, and at the very beginning, and I think it's in the 13th verse. And he said, oh, how I long for the day when I can see you face to face so that we might be mutually mm. encouraged by one another's faith. So I, I just thank God for each of you. I know there will come a day when we're together again. God, it's the, God said, it's not good for us to be alone. <laughs> it will happen. Mm-hmm. And, and thank you for your leadership in the middle. Could, could I pray for you all as we close? That'd be great. Father, thank you that you are the one who gave us a mind, a mind that asks questions, a mind that seeks to learn, that that is just a little lower than the angels. And thank you for each of the people here and all the attendees who have given their life toward the formation of that mind and soul. Uh, Lord, 
as we think through a really hard time and people are just asking, should we even open in the fall? My prayer for every one of the leaders that's listening to this is that you would grow their wisdom every single day, that you would let them be like the men of Issachar that understood their day and time, even on a daily basis, and were able to step forward in the way that would be most prudent and uh, most bullish for us to move your cause forward and to storm the gates of hell with the good news of Jesus through education and the church and all the ways that you move. We pray all of this knowing that you've seen this coming and you'll see it through to the end in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you all for being with us today. Thanks for